My name is Kayla. I want to invite you to stand as you're able um, as we worship God together this morning. Why don't you put your hands together? Won't be quiet. 
every tongue will confess. Amen. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? take your seats. I want to invite you to turn somebody ne- turn to somebody next to you, greet them, say happy Sunday, glad you're here. Good morning. There we go. Welcome to Gospel Life Carol Stream Campus. I had to rehearse that so many times to not think I was talking about the now North Wheaton campus. So um, if you're hearing that in announcements, that is now here, not over there. Um, But we are super excited to have you worshiping uh, with us this morning. We're continuing on in our um, True North series. And this week, we're going to be talking about making a plan. And that I got thinking about that, and it sort of reminded me of my honeymoon. So our first night on our honeymoon, we were grilling steaks. It was awesome. And Anna was so excited that she ran out the back door to see me, slammed the door, not realizing that it was locked. We had no phone, no keys, no nothing. It was snowing since it was January, and it was starting to become night. (laughs) We did not have a plan. Now, thankfully, the person who set up the Airbnb cabin for us had a plan. They had left an instruction book, which unfortunately was still inside, and it gave us a combination to their garage, which had a spare key. Now, not to brag, but being the rule follower, I read that book, memorized the code, found the key. So we got there. Yeah. I had to say that since Anna's downstairs. She won't yell at me later. But it just reminded me how important it is to have a plan and how lots of times in life, it's not us who who make the plan that really help us make it in life, but it's God's plan for us, which is far above and beyond what we could have planned out. So I'm just really excited to see what um, Pastor Tay is going to be bringing to us this morning about God's plan and the plans that we can make to fulfill his mission. Um, So... If this is your first week here, we have a thing that we do every week. It's called Take Five, and you can just stop out at the table um, and just take five minutes, and we'd love to get to know you a little bit better. Also, we're going to be starting up a new class. It'll be starting up February 6th, and so if you're interested in that class, we would also love to have you stop over at the Take Five table just to let us know who's interested in getting involved in that. It's going to be an intro to the New Testament class headed up by none other than Elder Corey Beck. (laughs) So um, I'm super excited for that. So if you're interested in that, just stop by the Take Five table afterwards. 
Also, again, we are just so thankful for everyone who's generously given. Um, we could not accomplish the ministry that we have here without you guys. Um, so we're just so thankful for that. Um, if you'll just bow in your, your heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful for you, how you have planned out our lives for us, that we have the opportunity to walk in life with you, and that we can follow in step with what you have planned for us. Lord, I pray that we, just as we come every single week, that we would have hearts that are open to hear what you have to say to us, and that we would be receptive and find application for that in our everyday lives. We thank you for how good you are to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand as we continue in worship. We continue to sing to our God who has given it all so that we might have life in him. Let's sing this out together.
Lord, we thank you for your grace and for the gift of your son, Jesus, that has defeated, uh, conquered death and defeated sin. We ask God um, that you uh, would just reign in this place, that your spirit would have its way. As we continue in worship, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. And we're actually going to sing um, another song. We're going to uh, teach you a new song that talks about, would it not be me who lives, um, but Christ who lives in me. Um, and so it comes through out of this scripture in Galatians 2.20, which I'll just read for you here. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so as we sing this song, I just invite you to let these words kind of wash over you. If you would uh, read through the lyrics on the screen, maybe shut your eyes, put your hands out, and just let, uh, let this be a blessing to you, that, that it would be our prayer, um, that it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold my hope is only Yeah. 
God, that is our prayer this morning, that it would no longer be us and our flesh that lives, God, but that your spirit would be at work in and through us. We pray that you would uh, open our hearts now to your word and your teaching. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. And the kids can go ahead uh, down to Children's Church if they have not already. Amen. Thank you so much to our worship team and Kayla. Praise God. Thank you, John. And some great reminders and truths that we are not our own and we live for Jesus Christ and alone. Amen. Awesome. We are diving into our last week of our uh, True North series. And um, develop your plan. And I hope to give you a few steps, and uh, we'll leak a little uh, vision throughout this sermon as well. But before I, I do that, um, let, me, let me pause and say I, I'm very grateful uh, to each of you uh, being here. They're very grateful for the con uh, conversations we had uh, last week and the emails and the calls, and, and I look forward to what God is going to do uh, in and through this congregation, through us, us through our church, and uh, I want to lift that up to the Lord here before we get started, and then give you a preview of what next week would look like, so you can hold off on your tomatoes today and save them for next week, okay? Uh, let, let's pray for this time. Lord, our hearts are full, just remembering how you called us out of darkness, how you've given us light through Jesus Christ. Lord, I'm grateful for a church that loves you, that love each other, and is committed to do what, what it takes for others to know and love you. So, Father, would you um, give us the grit? Would you give us the heart? Would you give us the fierce faith to say yes to what you are calling us to do? That we hold fast to the truth of God's word, that we hold true to the body of believers, Lord, to look like your church. Would you bless this message? Would you bless our time as we gather for the rest of this service? In Jesus' name, amen. So over the past four weeks, uh, church-wide, we've worked through your, your pamphlet or your booklet there, your guide, through our teaching series, True North. And uh, it's been designed each week to uh, help us set a course of long life joy. Uh, that is being found in Christ itself. So you see, Paul, uh, from the book we, we are preaching from, Philippians, see, although he's in jail, he wrote with tons and tons of joy. And over the past few weeks, we've been trying to, to set out before our congregation and even uh, as myself is, is well, what does it look like to leave a spiritual legacy? Some, we got a chance to live that out through parents or grandparents or others, our parents wasn't saved. And so now we get to cultivate and we create our own and leave it for our children, our friends and our other family members. What are you planning to leave behind? We flesh out our priorities for the moment of now and the future. Not, not just waiting until the next year, but prioritizing what really matters to us right now. And as well as we'll look at a few steps of what it takes to set a, uh, a couple steps in order for a path, for a journey uh, that, that we can live our life pleasing to the Lord by developing a plan. And when I think about all of these things, it, it reminds me, and I hope it reminds you, uh, I'm reminded as every part of who I am, every fiber in our being, it, it, the person of who we are, it is not for ourselves, but it is to be used by God. Uh, it, it's best said this way in a song by William McDowell, Lord, my life is in your hands. Lord, I'm longing to see you, your desires revealed in me. Here's what I do. I give myself away so you can use me. Here am I. Take it. So you can use me. Harvey's waving at me. Thanks for encouraging me, buddy. <laughs> a, a, a true transformed believer lives beyond his or her self. And here's what we do. We live our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel. That's my big idea this morning, that we will live our lives, that we, every plan we make, every step we take, 
it is in a manner worthy of the gospel. We'll, we'll get to that. And I think one of the first steps we have to realize is that our, our best days are ahead of us. Like we have to live life forward looking and forward living. I, I think about the transition from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Right? And, and, and the beautiful science that goes behind that. But if this butterfly would say, you know what, today I don't want to spare my wings, I'd rather go back in my cocoon. <laughs> like, no, we, we don't live life in yesteryears. The, the best life for that insect, that bug, is to live for. The best li uh, life for the people of God is that you and I live life forward. Realize our best days are ahead of us. I, I think Paul illustrates this so beautifully. Paul, who was radically changed by the gospel message, had one mission after he had an encounter with Jesus. And that was to simply advance the gospel message. In all he was, in every place he went, and in everything he did, the person of Jesus Christ has already achieved for us, and what he's done for us has called us to live worthy of the gospel message. And so last week, we, we heard in, in verse uh, 12 through 18 of how Paul advanced the gospel. And here's a couple of things I wanted to pull out for us that I thought was very helpful, that um, advancing the gospel mission must be done by, so if you're taking note, it must be done wholeheartedly, meaning completely sure your commitment level is at 100%. Your whole heart has to be in it. Like you will give it all to what you got. It has to be done confidently. No thinking twice. No room for doubt to lead us past our faith. I call this, you got to be faux show about it. Faux show. Like, matter of fact, you got to be confident that, yes, what God has started, we, we talked about that in week one, what God has started, he's going to bring it to completion and be for sure about it. it. It's confident when we are gospel living. How about this fearlessly, daring, audacious, head first, no matter what happens, we stand without fear that God's going to do a work in our lives, in our community, in our family, and so we go head on with that and for that. Uh, like Matthew Wilder said in his song, ain't nobody gonna break my stride. Nobody gonna hold me down. Oh no, I got to keep on moving. Like, fearlessly, we gotta keep going. No, no matter what. And then truthfully, you, you look through 12 and 18, you can read that as you get home, just a quick review. Truthfully, like there is no room for error. We stand on God's Truth. It's solid. It's facts. It's real. Nothing compares to it, truthfully. Nothing compares to the gospel message. That Jesus would come down, not consider himself to be equal, although he could have, but to love you and I just the way we are and to save us. Nothing compares to that message. And that I'm forgiven and I have a free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ and I have a home in glory Nothing compares to the message of hope. And then it has to be done lovingly. I say this with, with fondness, with care. That every time we go and we share the message of hope, we are inviting, not condemning. And we're giving them an invitation to come and see and, and, and eat from this good news. Not writing them off and throwing them away. So Paul pins here in Philippians uh, that advancing the gospel is also joyful. And it should cause us as children of God to rejoice, and that should be our life's aim. Mind you, Paul is writing this letter from prison in chains. And he is doing everything he can from behind bars to live a life that is hopeful and and joyful. Uh, American comedian and actor Flip Wilson once said this, if I had my whole life to live again, I don't think I have the strength. Pause one aim. Church, we get one shot to live our lives, to advance the gospel message of Jesus. And that may not look like up here preaching, 
It may not look like up here leading worship, but it does look like when you go to work. It does look like when you go to the grocery store or students when you're in the classroom or when you have family over. Like every opportunity we have, we get one shot to advance the gospel message. We are to live for Christ. Paul says in the few verses we're going to soon examine that if I live and I stay here, Jesus will be glorified. If I die and leave, Jesus will be glorified. I have one shot to live my life. So do you. So let's pick up here in verse 19 of Philippians chapter 1. Verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Christ, uh, this will turn out for my deliverance. Verse 20, I'm going to read on to verse 26. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed, but with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or death. Verse 21, for... For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ for uh, this is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in faith. Verse 26, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. What a, what a rich text. And, and I think this changes a little bit to how we see Paul. So, Here's an honest question. How many of us in this room talk to ourselves? I do. <laughs> like, some great conversations happen when we're talking to ourselves. Like, that's a great plan. I'm going to say that. I'm going to do that. We get to drop in on Paul now. He's really talking to himself. And this is Paul's example. So what I just read from 19 to 26, Paul is he's talking to himself in his jessa, and he lives out his example here. Or he shows us his example that, wait a minute, I, I'm in jail. Uh, something's going to work out for my deliverance. So what Paul means by that is Paul's trial has probably started by now. Paul was hoping to be acquitted. He, he wanted to get out of prison. He did not want to make that place his home, but he used it for the glory of God. And he says, so I, I, I hope to be deliverance. Uh, he's bound in prison chains. He's lost his liberties. He's faced opposition. And yet he was radiant with joy. That either two things are going to happen, either I'm going to die here or I'm going to get out and now die for Christ, advancing the kingdom message. He, he was hoping to get out. He was confident that his release or death would advance the cause of Christ. How much certainty was Paul living here? He said, I am eager and hopeful and I will not be ashamed. I'm going to be full of courage. Like he's reminding himself as he's talking, you know, Christ is going to be honored in my body, whether it's life or death. And he says, you know what? For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. If I stay here, I'll have some fruit. But if I leave, it's it's even better. And then he gets to this tension point that I think we all, we, we all wrestle with. It's the, it's the in-between of life. He, he says whether I stay here or whether I go, I am hard-pressed. Paul gets it, man. Life sometimes here on earth stinks. It's hard. It's challenging. There's moments of, of, of being down. There's moments that's joyful. There's moments to where I am hurt. Moments to where you and I have probably felt, God, are you even close? God, God, what's the next step you want me to take? God, my family's growing and that's exciting. Or all of our kids are out of the home. And what's next for our marriage? Or I've been on this job for 27 years. What's the next step I'll take? He says, the in-between of life will hard press you. He says, well, I can't tell you the decision. It's all, all, all in God's hand. 
But what he did know is that God would prove himself, hear me, church, to be sufficient in every event. Amen. God proves himself to be sufficient in every event. I can't tell, but I know Christ is with me. And so you will see my progress and joy. Sanctification of the believer. You, you and I growing in our faith. You and I becoming more and more like Jesus every day. And guess what, church? In every event, God will prove himself to be sufficient. He, he never falls short of his word. His hand is never short. And when we think he is never coming, God is always on time. So keep living life with fierce faith. Keep living life with joy. As a believer, as one who loves the Lord, who was walking according to his plan, Paul could do no more than express the alternative possibilities. He said life is going to happen or death is going to happen. And he doesn't know anything of the future other than that God holds it all. And that's a wonderful reminder that as our world around us, Christian values to what we hold true are changing who, who knows what's next with, with the health of our nation? Through it all, God will continue to prove, prove himself sufficient. He's going to hold us. He's going to carry us. He's going to lift up our bottom hair. He's going to build us up where we're weak. God has the power to reverse any trends that are out there. He has the power to move any barriers that comes our way. He's sufficient to do it. And so Paul, again, talking to himself, to himself, finally says in verse 21, and I'll go back to that, this famous verse, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. P Paul finds the meaning of life is Jesus. Like, when we, believers of God, when we said yes to, to Jesus entering to our heart, right, when, when we confessed our sin, at that moment, we've become his disciple. And he tells his disciples in the scripture, if you're going to follow me, you have to, you're going to take up your cross daily. Yes, that's the act of obedience, but also is the act of suffering. You have to take up your cross daily. And the meaning of that is all of who we are is to represent Christ. That's, that's the whole meaning of life. Paul is looking back on the day when Christ became his everything. And he says, whether I live, whether I die, Jesus will be proclaimed. Uh, think about, um, we say this around the, uh, the office, there's three gains in life. You got long-term gains, short-term gains, and eternal gains. At the end of the day, are we going to live our life for the long-term gain? Well, I put all of my, my resources and all of my time into this, and I just know it's going to pan out for me because I'm a great guy. I'm a great woman. My education is going to get me there. My socioeconomic status is going to get me there. Or do we look ahead that the eternal gain is when our life is over down here, and I hope God gives us many, many more years. But when he does decide to call us home, do we look, are we building everything on our lives now for an eternal gain that we get to be with Jesus? That he is our end goal. And, and, and Paul here defi defines, and, that, and then I'll get into some application. Life as, as gaining Christ, but death is the ultimate gaining advantage. Watch this. My, my desire is to depart from you. This is verse 24. And to be with Christ is far better. But to remain here in the flesh is more necessary. So God, whatever timing, whatever place you, you want me to go, the things you want me to say, it's going to be necessary for the people that are here. So that when people look at our lives, they see you in me. One of the commentary put this this way. He says, we can paraphrase this thought by saying, life means Christ to me as I more fully know, love, and serve him day by day. Death means Christ to me when I shall finally possess eternal, 
uh, e eternal place and enjoy him forever. Whether it happens here on earth or whether it happens in heaven, I'm going to set my lifelong goal to be joyful and living for Jesus. This is Paul's message. So, so how is gospel living done? How is the gospel life version done? It's done this, not being ashamed. Not being ashamed. If God has set us free through Jesus Christ, if he's given us grace and mercy, why be ashamed about that? There's no other message. We shouldn't. He's our hope. We, we, we do not be ashamed. We do it courageously and fierce. And I think about that word, fierce, like I will head into any situation because I know Jesus Christ is with me. I will stand tall on any conversation with a believer or any believer because I know God is always with me. Gospel living is done courageously and fierce. But then thirdly, it's also done with joy. And I think sometimes, let me, let me speak about my own life. I don't know about yours. Sometimes I miss out and I skip over the fact that I have joy, unspeakable joy, even in the areas and the, and the places where I, I, I can't even showcase it. Following Jesus should be joyful. Here's why. Because we should celebrate when people find and follow Jesus. We, we, we have a Savior who was so gracious enough to give his life. To, to, to not tell me I have to do a list from A to Z in order to get into his good graces. No, but to confess my sins and to believe on him and, and to walk in all of his ways. Like, it's joyful to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So when we represent gospel living, it should also be joyful. An unbeliever does not want to meet someone who's been baptized in lemon juice. Like, to have joy. Because it is joyful. We celebrate when people find Jesus. And then we live forward as children of God. We are sons and daughters of God. We live forward. So, so here's the best way I think I can paraphrase this a little bit or, or bring it home. Let me give you a little corpus um, or corporate campus visit uh, vision. Uh, corporate vision uh, a company or organization that sees itself in the future and therefore must be realistic and attainable. Like, like here's the vision of what I mean by campus. This church, this campus, will be about three things. One, we will forever preach and worship Jesus. If we ever move away from that, we should never exist as a church. Shut the door, sell the building, we're done. We will forever be about preaching Jesus, the only message of hope, and where we worship him. We forever seek him. L Lord, what is it? Because, yeah, there is sometimes in church life where, where we can have this vain idea about the man, uh, uh, about our own mission. No, no, no. What, God, what do, what do you want us to do? Where do you want us to go? We forever seek Jesus in all we do. In our kids' ministry, in our teen ministry, in our adult ministry, in our fall classes, the spring fall classes, everything we do, we see Jesus. Corporately together and individually at home. And then thirdly, we forever do the work of Jesus. Jesus is not here, but he left us, the body, to be his hands and feet. So how does that play out? I got a, a picture here of my first 100 days in office. <laughs> here it is in the spring. This is what we will accomplish. And you're going to hear more about this next week. Uh, next week. But prayer walks. There is nothing about the people of God sitting out two by two or family by family to go and beat the streets and cover this community in prayer. You want to see the darkness expelled? It's when we are praying and worn on our knees or worn with our feet and our mouth saying, God, have your way. Whatever you're going to do, here, here are we. 
This is our vision, church. Here we are. So we're going to do some prayer walks. We, we are going to be praying that when we go and knock and we canvas and we pass our hot, hot cards, it's going to be received. 500 doors. We would knock on 500 doors. We're going to invite 500. If we can go for 1,000, let's go for 1,000. But, but what we, all of us, we're going to knock. And here's the hope. All of this leading up to Easter so that on Easter Sunday morning, there are people flowing into this campus because of you have made the effort for them to hear the gospel. We are forever going to glorify Jesus in all we do. They're going to hear that they're loved. They're going to feel welcome. Their kids are going to go downstairs and they're going to enjoy who we are as a body of Christ. Well, how about summer? Well, we're going to have BBS. We're going to have Backyard Bible Club, whatever, however we want to do it, 75 to 100 kids on this campus are outside, are indoors, that these kids are be on the ground hearing the, hearing the word of God preached. I will fall. So much so, I want the heads in this community turning. They're going to drive by Gospel Life now. And they're going to see construction happening. And they're going to see this addition. And they're going to be buzzing. Wow, what is going on over there? That's going to offer so much growth. Just this morning, families and people were out there chatting and talking and connecting. I, want to, I told Scott, I said, Scott, I want to make the biggest mess I can. Biggest mess. And he says, well, Tay, you just changed your name. You should change it again to Our Lady of Perpetual Dust. The biggest mess we can make. Not to have the biggest building on the street. No, no, no. But to have the greatest Christians in the world who are coming here, gathering the information, gathering and growing in their walk so that they can then go out and do the work of Jesus. That's what we're going to do. We must have surging faith and gospel intention to believe Christ has the power to shine light in darkness, that Christ has the power to, to, to change any situation in any lives, and Christ has the power to save and call us into a greater work. That, that's what we're going to do. And, and here's what I, I don't have control over what or where God calls me to lead. But what I do have control over is the level of faithfulness I put into where God calls me to lead. So do you. So do you. To the level of grit and grind and faithfulness to the level that God has called you. So Paul then gives us our role. He gives us our mission. From verse 27 to 30. He says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come to see you or am absent, absent I may hear hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel vision corporate vision and not frightened in anything by your opponents this is a clear sign of them, of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Verse 29, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Ooh, praise God. Nobody walked out those doors. Because <laughs> as a Christian, we're going to walk through moments of suffering. He says, engaged. In the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. He's like, I'm in jail for a reason because I stood for what really matters. Yep, you, you won't always be the first phone call from the family member. I know those stopped in my day because what, I, what, what we stand for. Our, our role is that we live our lives worthy. And I wrestled with that word in my study time. Uh, what does it mean to live worthy? Like what qualities and attributes do I have, if any, to be called God's son? And, and what I came to a conclusion at the end of the day, but it was nothing that I could do. 
It was all that he did called me into a relationship with the Father. All that he did, catch that, all that he did, oh, what grace to trust him more. So since he did that and I said, yes, I have to live in a manner that is worthy of that, that is showcasing that, that, that is pleasing that. This is why we did this True North, uh, True North series that all that we are, all that we do, every plan we divide, every priority we set, every legacy we dream of is that it is in line that God has saved us and called us and we are living for him. And then he says, with that, this live life as worthy, I did some research on it, it's a political term, meaning you live your life as a citizen of dot, dot, dot. Wow. Paul's talking to people who, who, would, who, who, who get this of, wait a minute, when in Rome, you live like Rome. Wherever you go, Asia Minor, you live like those Asia. He says, so now, because you said yes to Jesus, you should live like a citizen who said yes to Jesus. What does that mean? You look back at um, Philippians 3.20. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would transform our lowly body. And Paul must have knew that I did not complete any of my 2022 goals when he said lowly body. To be his glorious body by the power that enables him to, um, to him even to subject to all things. He says our citizenship is not here. So we got to live life as a citizen of heaven. As a citizen of heaven. Uh, my bride, Samantha, uh, born and raised overseas and I enjoy going to see your family for the short time we do. And uh, we, we oftentimes go around the Christmas time to uh, Bermuda, wherever she's from. And, and every time we get to the airport, I get to uh, skip the American uh, passport line uh, and get to go into the line that Samantha is in because Samantha uh, has the, the passport and she's a citizen of, um, what did you say, England? Or, uh, Bermuda, it's a British territory. And so uh, as you're coming back to the island, you can get in the fast lane, fast um, line, or you can get in the American line. Okay, so we put on our passports and they stamp it. And I realize I am now enjoying life in Bermuda. And how silly I would look if I would wear a parka. Like, how silly I would look if I wear a, a three piece suit on the island. No, no, no. I live life as a citizen of Bermuda for the, for the small time I'm there. So I'm going to enjoy shorts, and I'm going to enjoy flip-flops, and I'm going to enjoy glory. Here's what Paul's saying. Listen, we live life worthy as a citizen of heaven. So here's what, here's what that means, that we do not face our fears, that we can't overcome them. That, that we don't face the loads of life, that we cannot triumph them. That we do not face life like we are cast down and aside. No, we face life as a citizen of heaven. Because what did Jesus do? Paul says it. He says to go back to, there's one day that Jesus would raise our lowly body to his glorious body. To a man who then took a beating on the cross for you and I for free. To a man that then put the crown of thorns upon his head and to suffer many things for you and I. What happened? He died and he rose again gloriously. So what a, what a, a picture of that you and I as believers will overcome whatever we face here on earth because of our great and gracious God. It won't be easy. Because he says there's going to come a point too to where you suffer, to where you will have to take up your cross daily. Church, let's learn to suffer well. He says for the sake of Christ, for you will suffer and you engage in the same conflict. I think here's a couple of things that I want to leave you with. Living, living worthy or living a gospel driven, however you want to say it, or, or, or my plan for 2022 is this. It's number one, that you would love God with all you got that you would love God with all you got, that there is no gas in the tank 
that there is nothing else you can give because you've given them everything. Number two, that you surrender all that you have to him. One of the greatest moments in the Christian life is when we go from this to this. Lord, it's mine, and I work hard, and, and I love it. My, my Buick that I love so much, Lord, I work so hard for I just paid it off, and God took it away in an accident. <laughs> when I go from this to this, Lord, I surrendered all to you for your glory. And Lord, if you just decide to use it for my good, that's great. But Lord, it's for your glory. My finances, my marriage, my single life, my kids, my grandkids, my job, my education, my talents, my skills, the list goes on and on, that we surrender all to him. And then three, that we stand firm until he returns. And we stand firm until he returns. Unshaken, not, not wavering. That whatever challenge, whatever opposition comes, uh, Paul was telling his first church plant here, remember this, that, that you will endure conflict just as I have. And we have an option to go head on in faith or to shrink back in fear. We stand firm until he returns. And then fourth and finally, we engage. We engage. Like, here's the greatest plan I think we can begin to work through for the rest of the year. Number one, we gather weekly in worship. Like, make, make this place a home. If not here, maybe another campus. Make this place a home. We gather weekly in worship. With that, we then decide to grow intentionally. Small group, reading God's word, prayer, other books that, that uh, develops your devotion for him. And then finally, in that engage, you serve someone in need. What, what, what does it look like to really be the hands and feet of Jesus to, to a person who, who, who wrote Christians off, to a person, person to think that, man, you Christians are on your high horse and, and you don't know much. But what does it mean to drop that card or to serve someone in need? I, I pray that as you work through the last section of this book this week, there's a pyramid there that you're going to work through. What's your annual, what's your monthly, and what's your weekly plan that, that you will set that is realistic, that is obtainable? Just say, Lord, here am I. Use me. Maybe, maybe that looks like this week, I will read this section of scripture. Or, or this week, I will reach out to my accountability partner and begin to pray and talk through the rough areas of my life. Or this week, I will write down the joys of life and pray over those things so I'm always reminded that God gives graciously to his people. And I pray it blesses your heart as you go through this next week of developing your plan, of setting your long life goal Jesus, I'm yours, and I'm yours forever. Use me as you will. Let's pray. Lord, so much of Paul's letter, it's real time, it's real life of how, how even in suffering, even in opposition, we must choose to live life joyfully. We must choose to live life hopeful with fierce faith of a God who never fails. A God who always draw nears. A God who, who never shuts us out. And who called us so graciously to himself through your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray for this church. I pray for your people. I pray that every day as we wake up, we choose to say yes to being used by you, that we don't shrink back, that we plow ahead in faith, that when we pray, oh God, we pray fervently, knowing that your power will show up, 
knowing that you would act. God, I pray for every family, every marriage, every, every single person represented in this room. Lord, that we do not grow weary in our well-doing, as your word says. God, for that sinner man, one boy or girl, this week, who will hear or will be shown the message of hope because of your people. God, I pray that you will soften their hearts even now. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to sing that song, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. I invite you to sing along as, uh, as you catch on. be our charge, our challenge, not I, Jesus, you. Jesus, you heal our land. Jesus, you use me as your workmanship to bring you glory. Uh, Let's be about that. Uh, I invite you next week again to uh, join us for worship. Uh, Next week, uh, I get a chance to share with you uh, really who I am uh, as pastor. And so I, I, I pray that you be here I think there'll be some challenging things said about uh, how God has called me, even from Toledo, Ohio, uh, to be here and uh, to to give my very best uh, to who I am for for Christ. So I hope you're here next week, and uh, then you get a chance after uh, to put me on the hot seat uh, to ask some questions uh, as well. And so I look forward to that next week. May the peace of God be with you. Go in peace.
you know, God is precise. Sure. Um, you know how uh, sometimes you hear, uh, like, if you